Robert Peden is carrying a most unusual cargo. So this is bee droving. Where, I'm a bee drover, that's what I do. I love it. It is a truckload of bees. 10 million refugees in desperate need of food and water. And we're trying to find something to feed them. We are. They've been starving on and off now for 12 months. So yeah, I'm very stressed at the moment. Rob is a dogged soldier in the war to stop our bees from dying en masse. Head them up, move them out. <laughs> it's a war being fought from outback Queensland to the pristine valleys of Tasmania. And they're not going to like us today, are they? <laughs> so we're going to tag some bees with our little microchips. That's not something you hear a lot, that sentence. We're going to just <laughs> tag some bees with little microchips. While these microchip backpacks track the bees every move, in ports around the country, high-tech surveillance cameras stand guard against foreign bees carrying a deadly parasite. Oh, it could be a huge swarm. It could be up to, to 10,000 bees. These are the front lines in Australia's desperate fight to save our bees from obliteration. Terrible fate that has wiped out hives around the world. It's a scientific mystery and a catastrophe for American farmers. Millions of bees are dying in hives across the United States, and nobody knows why. There's very few bees here. This is... Across the US, up to 80% of bees have been lost. There are no bees. While in China, crops must be pollinated by hand if they are to grow anything at all. Without the bees to pollinate, there simply won't be any fruit. So the fruit and veggies and that sort of food that we're used to eating certainly won't exist as it is today. No apricots, no peaches, no pears, nothing. That's right. So there is no substitute for bees. No, no, I don't think there ever will be. For almost the whole tenure of human life on Earth, the bees have been with us, so of course not in quite the conservation you're seeing here. But the point is, they have been so commonplace and so prolific that we've tended not to notice them. What we know now, of course, is that we will take the plight of the honeybee for granted at our own peril. Stephen, why isn't this the lead story on tonight's news? Well, that's a great question. I mean, without them, we're doomed. The world's beekeepers are counting on Stephen Quarrell and his scientific colleagues from the CSIRO. Can you give me the smoker? Okay. They've set up shop in the quiet hills of Tasmania's Huon Valley to work with the healthiest bees in the world. That's well, really quick. 5,000 down? Yep. 5,000 to go. <laughs> And to understand what's killing bees everywhere else, Steve and his team of researchers want to monitor the bees' every movement. So they're attaching miniature tracking devices. What kind of glue are you using? Um, garden variety super glue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That bee flew off very happy with its uh, seemingly with the with its device. Bling? Yep. Yep. So the microchips weigh um, approximately five milligrams. And a bee in pollen can carry easily three times that. Then, in an effort to save the bees, the researchers poison them. It's believed pesticides are one of the things killing bees because they short circuit the bees' inbuilt navigation system, preventing them from getting to the hive. So these bees are fed syrup, laced with pesticide, and then their microchip backpacks track their progress. So these tags are more like an e-tag, it's probably the best analogy that we've come up with. So each bee gets its individual little ID number, and we can see that individual bee come and go from the, from the hive. So it's like the old factory where you clucked on and clucked Yeah, that's it. We see them clocking in in the morning and clocking off in the afternoon. 
And if they and don't, it, if they don't come back the next day or yeah, come back in the afternoon, yeah, we know that they're dead. Something's wrong. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Mark, come and have a look at this. I'll show you something. Rob Peden doesn't need a microchip to know that his bees are dying. But look at all the dead bees on the ground. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. See, jeez, dead bees. They're just robbing each other because they're so damn hungry. Yep. This third generation beekeeper from the New England tablelands of New South Wales has never seen such carnage. He has less than half the bees he had five years ago. Honey production is now just a quarter of what it was. A tenacious drought means the trees are no longer flowering to feed his bees, so Rob's loaded them onto the truck in search of food, water, and flowers. When you see them dying in large numbers, how do you feel? Oh, it's um, heartbreaking, it's depressing to say the least, because in my dad's days back in the 70s, you know, our biggest problem was the bees were swarming all the time because they were overpopulated. Now, it's the big challenge now is getting the bees in the hives and getting them to stay there. It seems everything a bee needs to survive is under threat. So this is all leatherwood? Yes. Oh, mostly leatherwood here, yes. Quite enchanting, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? In the midst of Tasmania's Strathgordon rainforest, beekeeper Peter Norris makes some of the most magnificent and expensive honey on the planet. You like a taste? I would love a taste. Oh, but wait a minute, I'm going to suck it like Hannibal Lecter through the... No, no, you'll be right. Undo You're kidding? You. Yeah. Well, take... Yeah, I'll undo your veil. Well, don't let it be in. I won't let it be in. They're angry, aren't they? are not very happy. They're all right. Jeez. There you go. There you go. Oh. Oh, that was worth the danger. <laughs> But Peter's hives sit amongst the typical devastation left behind after wood chipping. Hectares of precious leatherwood trees have been clear felled. There are only a few groves left of the ancient flowering trees essential to Peter's bees and everything else. If you don't have leatherwood in Tasmania, you can't run commercial bees. If you don't have commercial bees, you haven't got the pollinators you need for your agricultural industries. Overseas, the situation is even more desperate because of a blood-sucking parasite called Varroa. It hasn't spread around the world through kind of sheer luck. It's, it's this amazing insect that can, you know, destroy a colony in a short space of time and it can reproduce incredibly quickly. It transmits all of these deadly viruses and the impact that it has on the bee is incredible. The beekeeper's worst nightmare, in fact. Yeah, definitely. The vampire mite latches onto the bee's back, sinking in its fangs and slowly draining away life. It has killed entire populations of bees. This is a total loss. And Australia is the last continent on Earth free from this fearsome invasion. Sam Malfroy is a bee and pollination specialist right at the forefront of Australia's defence against the deadly Varroa. Mate, you've got a hell of a responsibility, because if you don't get it right, it's a disaster, isn't it? It could be, yeah. I guess you've got to do the best with the resources that you've got at hand, and the program that we got in, we've got in place is probably one of the best in the world. At ports across the country, Sam Malfroy has set up these hives to detect and catch swarms of illegal immigrant bees. So this is this swarm just kind of starting to pour in. As the bees cluster into their new home, an alarm goes off and Sam slams the door shut from his computer, trapped. So when you see something like this, uh, the whole place goes to a kind of red alert, does it? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, all of these incidents are taken incredibly seriously because there's a lot at stake. Sam's system is working. Each bee is inspected for Varroa and so far 
Australia remains clean. If Varroa gets into this country, there will be a big shock to the system. I think the risk is that we'll uh, fall into the same category that other countries have and we've, we'll pick it up too late. So a lot of this program is about helping to detect these pests. To be successful in beekeeping, you've got to be able to go from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> That's what I like to say. Even without Varroa, Robert Peden is struggling to keep his bees alive. After two days of driving in search of flowering trees for his starving swarm, he finds promising country. Well, it's been a hell of a long haul across the seemingly endless reaches of Outback Australia, but I've finally arrived at the anticipated moment, the moment that I can call, release the bees! And this one, Mark, just, Jesus Christ. Charlie, get in the car, Charlie. I gotta put my gloves on. Get the smoker going, Mark. Bastard, bastards, Jesus Christ. Get down there, quick. Maddened with hunger and thirst, the swarm breaks oh, free in a frenzy. Robert keeps us at a safe distance, but he is in the firing line. That's what happens when they're locked up for 20 hours. Halfway across two states, we find what we've been looking for, hope. It's been a, a barren, drought-afflicted landscape. Here's yep. a tiny little flower of hope. Yep, the seed of hope. Well, congratulations. I never thought I'd get so excited about seeing one bee. It's just one bee, but many more to come. It's just the start of the season. So Robert's bees won't starve for the next month at least. It's only a stopgap measure, but Robert, like beekeepers the world over, is determined to win this war one hive at a time. And, you know, I'm just an old beekeeper out in the bush doing my thing and I'm not a scientist, but, you know, the bees are telling us there's something seriously wrong with the, the way humans are treating this planet and uh, if the bees disappear, in time will disappear. So the bees are a, a very vital part of the, our ecology. Uh, if they're gone, we're in a lot of trouble. Hello, I'm Charles Woolley. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.